We are so glad that you are here today. My name is Steve Lamott. I am the lead pastor here at the church. We have an incredible staff, and what a blessing to be part of that here. And uh, I am just blessed and honored by you uh, that you would come today uh, and trust us with an hour or so of your day. Uh, There are a lot of unfamiliar faces to me uh, here this morning. And so whether it's your first time or you've been here a couple times and, and we've just not had the chance to meet, I'm so glad you're here. And I hope that, uh, you know, if you're looking for a church home, that you'll consider Avenue. Uh, we are excited about what's going on here. Uh, we feel this is a, uh, a place where we are seeking to be who God calls us to be uh, in the best possible ways that we can. And uh, we'll get it right a lot of the times. And uh, we will screw up sometimes, too. We make mistakes uh, as well. But we are so glad that you're here. Uh, we hope this is a place you can feel confident to invite your friends to. Uh, that it's a space where you can grow in your relationship with Christ, uh, your relationship with one another, and your service uh, to all the world. Uh, So uh, we're excited about that. Uh, If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to open them. There's some in your pews if you need them. Feel free to pull out your phone if you've got YouVersion or some other app on there. Uh, And we're going to be looking at uh, Exodus chapter 17. Uh, It's also in your worship folder as well, too, printed there. Uh, We're going to be reading from there in just a moment. Um, So uh, this is our text. We're in a series uh, in the book of Exodus. We're kind of preaching through it right now uh, and teaching through it because it's an important book, especially this time of year as we're coming up. We're in the season of Lent. Easter is just like four weeks away, three weeks away. uh, And uh, Passover is an integral part of the Easter celebration and is so central to the the story in Exodus as well. So Exodus 17, verse 8. We'll get there in a second. Okay, ready? Uh, My kids love Marvel movies. Any Marvel fans here? Okay. Just like four of you. Okay, good job. I mean, it's made like billions of dollars, and there's only four people who like Marvel movies here. Great. Okay. I don't particularly like them either, so that's okay. But that's a whole other story. That's not for here. But like superhero movies, are they can be a lot of fun, right? I think there's like three kinds of superheroes. Uh, And and you can check me on this. I might be wrong. But there's like three kinds. There's like uh, the superhero that's born a superhero. This is Superman, right? Uh, Alien, birth, foreign, you know, some other planet has all these superpowers, right? I know he's not Marvel. That's okay. Uh, but like you have Superman. That's one kind. The other kind is like Spider-Man, bit by a radioactive spider and becomes a superhero and has to learn with great power comes great responsibility. Okay, thank you, the four of you that knew that too. That's great. I'm glad. I was counting on the four of you to know that quote. That's actually not from the Bible, okay? I know some of you are like, isn't that somewhere in Matthew? Didn't Jesus say that? Uh, No, with great power comes great responsibility. Spider-Man, that's the whole appeal of Spider-Man, right? Is that he has to learn and lean into what it means to have uh, that power. Uh, the uh, The other is Iron Man, right? He builds himself into a superhero with his with his suit. I will say there is one other. There's Batman, who's just awesome, because he's got like all the tools and gadgets, and he's just kind of a natural guy doing incredible things. But think of Iron Man with me, right? Tony Stark uh, becomes Iron Man when he puts on his suit. He created this suit, this exosuit, exoskeleton suit, whatever you want to call it, uh, to be able to be and become a superhero. That suit enabled him uh, to do superhuman things. Uh, There is, you know, I think in a lot of us, there's this idea that wouldn't it be great if we had these sort of things? And you see it in the supervillains like Doc Ock and other ones like that that have these abilities because of the suits that they wear. Uh, in our human condition, uh, in our medical human condition, there are, uh, there are diagnoses and conditions that render our muscles and arms and legs either uh, useless Uh, render them weakened, whether it's muscular dystrophy uh, or something like that. We have muscle weakness, decreased mobility, making things very difficult. And whether you uh, suffer from something like that or you have a friend or family member uh, that that, carries that diagnosis, it makes things really, really difficult. But there is technology out there that is being developed uh, wearable technology, muscle, much like an Iron Man suit, although not that heavy, uh, of like slings and shirts and stuff that use computers and electrodes and all sorts of other things to tap into our muscular system and, and into our nervous system and be able to strengthen our arms and our muscles. And so there is a shirt called a Mayo shirt, and um, it is able to increase muscular output in research by 61%. 
uh, because of these exo tendons. I know this is way above my pay grade over here on these words and stuff like that. But, but these movements uh, can strengthen the person who is wearing them. And they really give hope to someone that maybe has like a muscular dystrophy or something else that one day they will be able to regain the use of their arms, their legs, whatever it might be, and, 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 and get back normal functions. And so currently this Maya shirt is a soft wearable exo muscle, muscle for the arms and shoulders. It's like a vest with some cuffs on it, uh, accompanied by a small box in the back that is the computer. One of the great challenges of, of this Mayo shirt right now is the computer weighs nine pounds. Uh, you know, and so part of the challenge is getting that technology uh, smaller so that it can be uh, used more, uh, more frequently. But the Mayo shirt strengthens and provides assistance to those who have deficiencies in their muscular system. This morning, we're going to look at a passage from Exodus where Aaron and her strengthen Moses uh, and when, he, when his muscles literally get weak. And we're going to consider how you and I, as Christians, can strengthen one another in our life. So uh, Exodus chapter 17, uh, if you've got it there, we'll read through that together. It'll be on the screen as well. Uh, but chapter 8, I'd love for you to open up your Bibles. If you have them, you can write notes in them. It's okay to write in your Bible. Uh, no one's going to, you know, no lightning bolts from heaven for writing in your Bible. Okay, Uh, Exodus 17, verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some men for us and go out. Fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses told him and fought with Amalek. While Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Whenever Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. And whenever he lowered his hands, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands grew weary, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side, the other on the other, so his hands were steady until the sun set. And Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this as a reminder in the book, and recite it in the hearing of Joshua. I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner." And he said, a hand upon the banner of the Lord. The Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. God, we pray that as we look at your word today, uh, that you would open up our hearts uh, to what it means uh, to both be strengthened and to strengthen the arms of others. God, in our weakness, help us uh, to confess our weakness so that you might be our strength. Holy Spirit, open our hearts and our minds today so that we might hear from you. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, so let's, let's go through the story. Let, let's tell the story and just get a sense of what's going on here so that we can tie it in to ours. Now remember, in, within the book of Exodus, here comes kind of our, our, our recap. This is the part you skip through when you're watching the TV series, right? You skip through this part. But like God has led Moses and the Israelites uh, out of Egypt, 10 plagues, right? Uh, there was the Passover plague. All the firstborn died that didn't have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. Pharaoh tells Moses and the Israelites, leave, they leave, they get to the Red Sea, they're kind of trapped between a rock and a hard place because Moses and all his armies come after them. God tells Moses to raise up his staff, the staff of God, which we see here again. The waters part, Israel walks on dry land. When Pharaoh and the Egyptian armies come chasing after them, the waters come crashing down. Israel is free from slavery, there is celebration, there is worship, there is excitement for three days. And then they start complaining like a petulant little child, you know, uh, because they're like, we got no snacks. Mom, we don't have any cookies. Dad, we don't have any whatever. You know, there's no pizza place here. You know, nothing is available to them to eat. Uh, They want something to drink. And so God provides water out of a rock, sends them this kind of flaky-like substance. It was the popcorn last week if you were here, right? This manna on the ground, which in Hebrew means what is it, basically? Because no one knew what it was. It was weird. They they ate it. Uh, And he provided that for the next 40 years. Uh, and then on the weekends, they got quail. You know, it was like, hey, it's time to feast. It's the weekend, filet mignon. Uh, so, uh, but that, that's what happened. They come through all of this. Now you have this tribe of Israel, this large nation, moving through the territory of somebody else. And so there is this tribal warrior, this warlord, this king named uh, Amalek. 
And he uh, has sent his people, or the Amalekites, to go and fight against Israel. And Moses knows that they're coming. They see him coming off in the distance. And Moses tells Joshua, this is our first time encountering Joshua in the Bible. There's no details given about Joshua, even though he gets this whole book because people knew who Joshua was then. But he tells Joshua, you have one day out of all the people of Israel to pick the best fighting men to go out and meet the Amalekites. And I am going to go up to the top of the hill uh, with the staff of God. I will take Aaron and her with me. Aaron is Moses' brother. And we will stand on the hill with the staff of God in our hands overwatching it. If you think like you know, medieval movies and scenes where like the king and his officers are up on, over top the hill looking down on the battle and what's happening and directing things. That's kind of the scene we have here. So the next day, uh, the scriptures tell us, Joshua gathered his SEAL team that he developed and, and, and recruited the night before. They had a lot of training, about three hours, uh, something like that. Uh, and they went out and faced the Amalekites. Exodus tells us that when Moses took the staff of God and raised it above his head, that Israel prevailed. But when his arms got tired and his hands dropped, that the Amalekites prevailed. Momentum turned in the favor of the Amalekites. When Aaron and Hur recognized this, they saw what was going on from the hill in the battle there. They, they took Moses and said, sit down, have a seat. There was a large rock there. And they sat him down. And then they got up under his arms, whether with their hands or with their shoulders, it doesn't matter. They held his arms up so that they could stay in the air. And Exodus tells us that they held his arms up until sundown when Israel sealed the victory. Uh, just a little side note. Can you imagine how numb Moses' arms must have felt? Have you ever held your hands above your head in like one position and all the blood drains out and you're like, I can't feel anything. What's going on here? So anyway, I, that's what I thought of when I read the text, how numb Moses' arms must be. So at this point, like Israel wins the battle. They prevail over the Amalekites uh, through, um, through Moses and through God. And we got to think of, wonder, like, what's going on here? Uh, some sermons you'll hear and in, in interpretations of this passage is that while Moses was on this hill, that he was praying to God uh, when he had his staff up and his hands fell. He was, and, 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 and it becomes about an intercessory prayer. And, and all that can be good to pray for others, that we should. But the text doesn't tell us that actually happened. In fact, the text doesn't say anything, that Moses did anything there other than lift the staff of God in the air. Now you have to wonder too, like was there something significant that when Moses held the staff up and the soldiers, Joshua and his men, looked up and saw the staff of God that they got encouraged, like yeah, Moses is holding the staff up. We got this, guys. Like it's probably a bad practice. I've never been in the military or anything like that. And I try to avoid fights for the most part. You know, been in a few over my lifetime. But like if you take your eyes off the person who's coming after you and trying to hit you with a sword or a club or a rock or whatever, it's not generally a good thing to take your eyes off them. So maybe Israel's not looking at them. So so what's happening? The best interpretation that I can give you and, and thought that we have is that somehow God uses this staff that has been used throughout the Exodus story as a conduit of God's power. Right? When Moses took this staff and threw it down uh, before Pharaoh, what did it turn into? It turned into a snake. Right? The staff is what Moses raised again when they were at the Red Sea and the Red Sea parted. Moses didn't do anything other than obey God to lift the staff up in the air. And here we have the same thing again. It's Moses, just, Moses knows that somehow this staff is a symbol of, representative of God's power that works through us. God's power that is at work in, in the world. And so this staff becomes a symbol of the power of Yahweh and miraculously becomes a conduit of God's power. And so when Israel wins the battle the next day, Moses comes and he builds an altar. This is a pretty common theme if you read through the Old Testament, where Old Testament characters, after a significant event, will build an altar somewhere. They pile up a bunch of rocks, they sacrifice some animals, they thank God for the victory, for the provision. This is something memorable that ha happens, right? And, and so Moses wants his people to remember how God provided the victory for them. Uh, and, and so this becomes really important, and he calls the altar Jehovah Nisi. 
uh, which Pastor Nada said a couple weeks ago, is uh, last week, is God is my banner. That would be the best English translation of it. God is my banner. And, and so think of this again, like the, we have the ideas of like the medieval kings and whoever off on the hillside and standing up there and they've got their flags and their banners and with their lions on it or their dragons, if you're a house of dragon person or, or, or whatever they've got on there. And they're standing there with their banner while everyone else fights. And when you were under the protection of the king, you lived and stood under their banner. And so when Moses calls this altar, God is my banner, God is our banner, it is a reminder to all the people of how God provided them the victory here and that God was to be their protection and their strength and their provision. The altar was not called Moses is our banner because Moses didn't do anything except hold the staff up. And it wasn't called God's staff is my banner because they weren't to put their trust in the staff or in Moses. The altar was called God is my banner because their trust was to be in the Lord. Their trust was to be with God. God fought and won the battle for them. And this kind of harkens back a little bit when Moses was in front of the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army was coming. And and, and God told Moses, the Lord will fight for you You only need to be still. That God will fight the battle for us if we just trust God and be still. I don't know about you, like I like to get frantic over things, right? Like if we're going to be in a fight, real or otherwise, I want to come out with fists ready to go. I'm going to be flailing and uh, kicking and all the things to try and get the victory that's there. But the scriptures remind us all through the Old Testament that God fights the battle for us. So what do we do? How do we bring this into our time today? First is I want to suggest that we have to run under the banner of God. That if you and I are going to live our lives as followers of God, followers of Jesus Christ, disciples, and and we live and, and identify as Christians, then we have to align ourselves under the proper banner. Just as soldiers, again, we've said this twice, but they would go under and and march under a certain banner. They would carry it. It would identify the kingdom that they are a part of. And for you and I as followers of Christ, as followers of God, if that is our desire, then we have to carry the banner of Christ with us. We have to stay and live and make our camp under that banner. Why? Because, Because God fights for us. Because there is protection there from God. There is provision there. Not not just like physical provision, but the spiritual provision as well. As we think of like Jesus dying for us and, and, and defeating sin that we can't defeat ourselves. In the battles we face in life, we have to come and trust that God fights the battle for us. And that we only need to be still. And that we need to sit and camp and live under the banner of God. In the Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 4, it's not a book we cover in Sunday school. If you've ever read it before, you know why. Uh, But it says in there, it says, "Let, Let him lead me to the banquet hall and let its banner over me be love. The image, it's a, it's a poem, and it's of a, uh, of a woman who's coming into a relationship with, with Solomon the king, and, and her, his banner over this woman is love. We see this in God as well. That when we are under God's banner, it is a banner of love. That God loved us so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for us because it was a battle we cannot win on our own. Because God loves us and loves you. The question becomes is like, or, or the thought is like, too many of us are trying to fly our own banner. Too many of us are trying to live under the banner, someone else's banner. That, that, that this relationship will be my strength. Uh, if I get this relationship right, it's going to fix everything. Or, or that if I live under the banner of success, uh, financial success, financial security, you know, then everything's going to be okay. Uh, I, you know that when I do marriages and weddings and things like that, uh, I, I, I do premarital counseling. We meet like four to six times. And, uh, you know, Andrew and I have been married. It'll be 24 years this year. And, and I'll have people like, so why did you wait so long to get married or why now? And like, or why are you waiting if someone's not yet getting married? And they're like, oh, we're waiting, for, we're waiting to get our finances in order and all these things. And I just want to look at them. I'm like, we've been married 24 years. I don't know that our finances are ever ready. 
for marriage and life. Every time we think we're ready, like another kid comes along the way or, or the car breaks down or like we decided like the roof needs replaced, like you're never, but we try to live under that banner of financial security or relationship security or job success when what we're called to live under is the banner of God and the banner of Christ because true protection, true provision comes, comes from God. We must live under the banner of God. Secondly, what we can learn from this text is that we need to strengthen and hold up the arms of the weary in the midst of the battle. We have to strengthen and hold up the arms of the weary in the midst of the battle. In our passage, when Moses' hands and the staff of God are raised in the air, Israel's winning. They're, they're, they're approaching victory, but as soon as his hands drop, the battle turns in favor of the Amalekites. And so Aaron and Hur supported Moses' arms when they became weak. You know, the, the, the Old Testament's written in, in Hebrew, right? Uh, if you didn't know that, it's written in Hebrew. Uh, and so what we read is an English translation, obviously. But there was, at some point prior to the writing of the New Testament, um, there was uh, written a, translated a Greek copy of the Old Testament because much of the world was Greek-speaking, thanks uh, to the Roman Empire and, and, and the Greeks expanding as well. And, and that language was just pro- proliferated. And so when people wanted to write uh, and read the Old Testament, they translated it into Greek. And, and Greek's helpful to us because the New Testament is also written in Greek. And so we can see some commonalities on how words are used and how we might understand what's in the Old Testament based on how people in the first century understood it uh, so that we can understand it now during our time. And so in the Greek of this passage, in this chapter, when it talks about how they would hold Moses' hands up, Aaron and her, there is the Greek word there, sterizo. You want to say it? Do you want to try it? Sterizo, right? Okay, now, those of you that are thinking, can you hear the word steroid in there? There is the root in the Greek of the word steroid, sterizo. Sterizo in the Greek means strengthen, And so when Aaron and Hur hold up the arms of Moses, it's not just that they held it up under their strength. Somehow in doing that, in coming alongside of Moses and and supporting him, they were strengthening the arms of Moses. Their support acted like a steroid to make him strong. In the midst of the battle he was facing. And we see this all through the New Testament as well. Let me give you just like four quick uh, examples. Luke chapter 22, Jesus says, When you, Peter, turn back, strengthen your brothers. Sterizo. Uh, Acts chapter 18, Paul traveled, strengthening all his disciples. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2, we send Timothy to strengthen and encourage your faith. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, but the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. Timothy, Paul, Peter, all sent out in a variety of ways in their ministry to strengthen those they were ministering to. God goes out in this presence of Christ to strengthen us and to protect us from the evil one. When we encourage And support one another when we come alongside someone in the midst of their battle, in the midst of the the junk and garbage that they are going through, we strengthen one another. And so in this battle in, in Exodus 17, think about Moses, right? He is the anointed, the chosen, the charismatic leader of the Israelite people, and he needs Aaron and her to come alongside of him and do the job. Even he can't do it by himself. In fact, just a little tidbit, like if you read the next little story, it's Moses going back to his father-in-law, Jethro, who's not even Israelite, okay? Uh, Truth comes from a lot of places sometimes. And Jethro, Jethro tells him, Moses, you can't do it on your own. You need to pick leaders. And he picks leaders of tens and leaders of 50 and leaders of 100, all these things, because you can't do it on your own. And so oftentimes in our life, we want to be, we want to be Lone Ranger Christians, We want to be Lone Ranger individuals because we think we're strong enough or we don't think we need anybody. And we have this for whatever reason, and I'll be honest, I do it too, but we put up this wall around us and we say, I'm strong enough. I can handle this. 
And we'll tell people, and we fake it so well. Anyone want to, we fake it so well in church, don't we? We come in, like, how's it going? Like, things are great, right? Things are great. They're good. God is good. Amen. Hallelujah. And then, like, when we're home, we're in tears because life is collapsing around us. There was a commercial uh, I loved. I love this commercial. Uh, I can't even remember what it's for. It's some bank. And there was this guy, awkward-looking guy, and he's riding a lawnmower. And, and he says, everything is great. I'm in debt up to my eyeballs. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, this is the attitude that we bring into the church. This is the place it should be safe. To say that life, can I say this here? Life really sucks right now. This should be the place that we're able to say, I'm really struggling This is the place we should be able to say, I'm doubting my relationship with God right now. And we should be able to say those things because we should trust that our brothers and sisters in Christ will come up and hold our arms up in the air when everything in us wants to drop them to the ground. And instead in church we become judgmental and we become, I don't got time for that because you know and I know it's the truth. To get involved in someone else's garbage in life means it takes time, it's messy. You know, some of that stuff sometimes transfers into our life and we have to figure out how to filter it through so it doesn't affect our own family uh, and friends. But we still do it because someone did it for us. Starting with Christ who died our death, who took on our sin, who carried our cross. And so we're called to do that for others. There are people sitting here today and in the first service who are bleeding out emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally, and who need a hospital, which is supposed to be the church. And sometimes we get so concerned about our carpet and our pews and these things, whether in reality or metaphorically, that we don't want to deal with garbage and struggles and battles. But we all face them. We all go through them. Some of you have gone through battles and have so much wisdom and encouragement to offer somebody else. Some of you who are older, especially more mature in your faith, not just older chronologically, you have so much to offer a young person or someone young in their faith to strengthen their arms to come alongside of you. Some of you have overcome things in your marriage and your relationships that you're able to come alongside other people. But if we don't know... And we don't ever talk about it. We can't ever strengthen one another. We can't ever hold one another's arms up. Um, Some of you have have, have lifted weights before. I should, Jared's here. I should have him come and talk about this, right? Like, uh, Jared's our residence CrossFit, you know, weightlifter. Uh, I've done a little bit. Like, when you lift weights, sometimes it's helpful to have a spotter. Uh, when you're lifting and you get to a point where maybe it's, uh, at least you need an exit plan, but like you got to have a spotter there that when, when you're getting to the point where you're lifting a bench press or squat or something that, that you have a way somehow to get safely do what you need to do. And if you can't do it, a bench press and lift it up, you don't want it to fall on your chest. you got someone there to help you. That spotter looks out. They shouldn't touch the bar, at least in my mind or thinking, like, unless they absolutely have to because you want to be able to, to push it up yourself. When that moment comes and your arms fail, the spotter is there to catch the bar, to preserve your life, to save you in that moment. We're called to spot one another, to see when each other's struggling and and wrestling with things in our lives and to come in and to help out when needed. This has become uh, really, um, this has become really personal for Andrea and I uh, over the last couple months. for those of you that, that may not know that are new here today, uh, Andrea was diagnosed with breast cancer in November and um, has, has, has had some procedures in, in January and, and recently here a couple weeks ago. And um, it'll save a lot of answering questions here afterwards. She got a clean bill of health the other day uh, that she's cancer free. So, uh, and, you know, as much as we're grateful for her surgeons and the doctors, like, like we God answers prayers. And God fights the battles for us in that way and, and uses the medical community for that a lot of times. Uh, but the point of this is, aside from just answering questions and, and helping out there, is that I got asked like 15 times before service this morning, I'm like, I should just share this as part of this. But um, you all have come alongside and strengthened our arms. 
There has hardly been a day that's gone by that we've not received a card from someone in the church. Uh, there have been numerous meals from the church and from Andrea's colleagues at her school who have been amazing too, uh, who have strengthened our arms, phone calls, text messages, uh, rides. Some of you have taken our kids all the way up to Wilmington for practices and tournaments and things like that when we had other things going on, just checking in. This is how the church should operate. And it shouldn't just operate this way for the pastor and his wife. It should operate the whole way across with everybody. And this is why it's so important for us to get to know one another and get to a point where we can be in a small group or a Bible study or someplace where we get smaller and we can share those things because it's so hard on Sunday mornings. I have a hard enough time learning your names on Sunday mornings. Uh, you know, but so that we can connect and strengthen one another's arms up. And so my challenge today as we think about this uh, is that you know, we, this is what we're called to do as the church. We're called to love one another and show that we love one another. And people won't know that we love one another until we show them that we love one another. You can say that, uh, you know, you're going to help someone out in a cert certain situation until you show up on that Saturday morning at 10.30 a.m. to help them move the couch. Uh, you know, <laughs> no one knows you're really going to, you know, they know who to count on. It means something. And so for those of you who are hurting today, there are some of you who are silently and secretly hurting. You are trying to handle everything on your own. You're trying to manage life without dropping uh, any of the proverbial balls that you're juggling or the plates that you're spinning and all those sorts of things. But you know you're just a, f you know, you're just a fraction of a second away from everything coming crashing down. Or maybe it already has. This morning... My challenge is that you need to ask for help. You need to find someone, whether it's through the pastoral team, whether it's someone here at church, someone that you trust that is more spiritually mature, that can guide and direct you or point you someplace, say, I need help. I need prayer. When we start, stop allowing these things to be secret, when the secret's broken, this is when the power of God can come in and heal. Don't be a lone ranger Christian. You're part of the body of Christ, and you don't have to go through whatever you're going through alone. Secondly, some of you have been through something. You have, experience, you have experience and wisdom and compassion and empathy that allows you to strengthen the arms of other people. I get it. It gets tired. It gets hard to do that. But if we do it as a church collectively, for those of us that are sitting here, for our neighbors, for our family, we work together, we, we pray and how to encourage one another as we encourage one another, then we have a ministry to show God's love and God's grace. You have the, the opportunity to, to make meals and send cards and make visits and text messages and phone calls and to pray with someone. Some of these don't have to take very long at all. But consistently doing them and being available strengthens the arms of those you love and care for. So today, as we come to the communion table, as we come to receive the presence of Christ, we remember that when we were weak, Christ became our strength. When we were to die for our sins, Christ took our place so that we might have life. And we know that Jesus fights the battles for us, and that in the midst of those battles that Jesus is there.